So our, when I was a student here, this is actually a photograph I took when I was a student here. I know the Y didn't look like this anymore. Uh, it was bleached white back in the day. Uh, but I was co-president of the Campus Y. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting is m I was also at the AJ school. I got a D in Rich Bagwin's class. Uh, <laughs> but my, the, the journalism world in the J school and the Campus Y social change uh, community on campus were completely different worlds. Like I didn't have any professors that overlapped. I didn't have any any friends or uh, fellow students that overlap. They were completely different worlds. Um, and I always, I struggle with that uh, a bunch, but I found now looking back at at least my career so far, it's been about bringing those two worlds together. Uh, it's about, you know, communication, but also about changing the world and improving the world. Um, so that's been an interesting thing. And then um, I also, when I was at the uh, Campus Y, I got Apples going, uh, which has now grown considerably because of the student leadership around that, which is such a proud thing to come back and see how much it's grown. So um, I'm going to tell you one story from Seeing Beyond Sight before we launch in, because it, it sort of defines my calling, and then I'm going to ask you all sort of what you felt when you first got involved in communication, media, and journalism. Um, but so I did this book, Seeing Beyond Sight. Chronicle Books published it. And this book, or this photograph changed my life. It's by Lawanda Forbes. And uh, as you can imagine, when blind students take pictures, they don't use their eyes. Uh, they, they use other senses. They listen to the world around them. We call the program Sound Shadows because they listen to the world around them instead of looked for shadows. They listen for shadows. So when the pictures came back, and this was in the days of film, so every picture costs money <laughs> to take, um, the pictures would come back and we would describe every picture to them. And, um, and the students, since they were listening to the world around them, they sometimes would aim too high or too low and get the you know, sky or the lights or the sidewalk. And, and so when this came back, uh, we took out Lawanda's pictures and I started describing them. I said, you got a sidewalk, put it to the side, went to her next picture. And she said, wait a minute. I meant to get a picture of the, the sidewalks. I thought it was maybe she meant to get a picture of a friend on campus or something. And she said she wanted to take a picture of the cracks in the sidewalks because her cane got stuck in it and she wanted to get them fixed. And um, <laughs> so she uh, wanted to write a letter to the superintendent. So we sat down and we wrote this letter, Dear Dr. Brightweiser, since you have the privilege of sight, you probably walk on these cracks every day and don't notice them. But for me, it's a problem. My cane gets stuck. And you know, here are pictures as proof of the damage. Uh, and what's so great about this, there's a bunch of things. One is what's so great about this is that she learned to communicate in a language that wasn't her primary language, a visual language. She knew it would be salient to, to make change in the world. Um, and the second thing that's really powerful to me is that the cracks represent cracks across all sorts of lines, racial lines, gender lines. Uh, you know, uh, economic lines. And, you know, those cracks, sometimes we see, sometimes we don't see, sometimes we need other people to see them. So for me, you know, I walked in these cracks every day. I saw, I could see them, but I couldn't see them, you know? And so I feel like, for me, this defines my calling in the world, which is about using communication to both notice and learn about the cracks myself, but also then help other people see the cracks. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm going to ask you all to answer that in a minute. Um, so this is basically what we're going to cover. Um, the, I, I have a lot of information here, and I haven't presented about this. So I, I sort of want you all to bear with me. And if it's too much, just interject and add your own opinion or tell me to move on. Uh, I wrote a lot about it. I've thought a lot about it. But I just haven't presented it as much. Um, but it's, uh, I'm going to present a framework, I think, that I mean, media is changing so fast. Anytime you write something down, there's something new about it. And it was hard to write this report because you know David Carr would write something else in the New York Times, and I have to read that, make sure it like jives with stuff. You know, and so it's a move. It's a moving target. It's really hard. Uh, so we set up the framework in a way that that's adaptive and can be used no matter what trends you might prioritize at any one time. So I'm going to set up that framework for you, uh, really briefly, and then I'm going to cover the four questions, uh, which are these four areas, and I'll go into that in a, a little bit more. And then, if we have time for discussion, it might be 45 minutes, 30 minutes, whoever wants to hang around. And then feel free to get up and leave. I'm not offended if anybody wants to take off. Um, uh, the two questions that were posed to me by Dean Fulker and by Paul Jones was that uh, these two questions, which is, how can we think differently about new models for journalism in order to take revo revolutionary leaps? Now, I don't have an answer to that. There's not a clear-cut answer to that. Um, but it's something we can discuss. And I'm, I'd be curious your, your perspective as well. And then the second is, who will create the next stage of our profession? Um, because you all are here to do that. That's what the school exists for. And how can we shape it? So I love that, how can we shape it, 
question that Dean Fulkert asked. And, um, and, and it reminded me of this one quote that I pulled out of the report. And it says, uh, most people assume that the future is something to be predicted rather than created. The future does not simply happen to us. We shape it. Uh, and it's from Daniela Meadows. Some of you all might know about her work. She's a, a really well-known uh, systems thinker. Uh, and and, and sh she frames a piece of the report as well. So just as a little bit of a background, um, the, the big thaw is in three, a three-volume set, and I have a little one-page handout, and you all can take as many as you want if you want to share it for some folks. It's on the back table. And it basically sets up the framework. It looks at the old paradigm of journalism and the new paradigm of journalism to get at what the opportunities are. And then it covers new and emerging realities and then future things, things that aren't game changers yet, haven't reached the scale for game changing, but have potential for game changer um, you know, scale. So. And then also, the big thought, you can also download the report for free, at, free uh, at that URL on the bottom. So I was paid, the, my client was the Media Consortium. So I was hired by the Media Consortium. And they're a network of 45 leading progressive publications. So and these are a few of the members there. Uh, definitely left-leaning. The, the, whole, the whole report doesn't take a left-leaning stance. It has some stuff about progressive media, but it's more about uh, media in general and how media is changing and maybe particularly more about independent media and, and, that, and independent media I think is growing uh, these days. And then we did a bunch of expert, expert interviews. So we, the whole process lasted about a year. We did scenario building uh, to paint pictures of possible futures, identified a bunch of uncertainties. We did expert interviews with people outside and you might recognize some of the names like Clay Shirky or Vivian Schiller who's the new CEO of NPR. Um, and got their thinking on, on it, and then did a scan of all the literature and stuff that's out there now, like <laughs> folks like David Carr and other folks that are hard to keep up with. Um, so the big thaw, the name the big thaw, it came from uh, this quote. You all might have seen this. Clay Shirky put it out, and it got kind of controversial on his blog. And it says, no one's been caught up in this great upheaval about the fall of the print business. This change has been uh, more like seeing an oncoming glacier 10 miles off and deciding not to move. So this got a lot of controversy, as you can imagine, because uh, journalists, and, and, and my client was a bunch of journalists. They're, they were like, you know, reporters and people that have been publishing for a while. And they were like, we feel like we've been beat over the head over and over about this change that's coming on that we didn't see it. And they were like, we don't want to hear that anymore. We, you know, we want to get to solutions. And so um, that's sort of what we ended up focusing on is like, how can we take that metaphor and say, what's a, a more of appreciative inquiry uh, around that metaphor? Um, and so this is sort of what we came up with. And that is that even though things are melting, there's a strategic dissonance between the old ways of working and the rapidly changing industry. It's hard to keep up with some, something that's moving so fast. But the tension itself is what creates the opportunities. And the metaphor goes to like looking at the Nile, the flooding of the Nile. Instead of saying flooding's a problem, we're gonna drown, the Nile, it, the flooding replenishes the, land, the landscape. And so how do we look at it, at these changes as a way to replenish uh, and have opportunities? So strategic dissonance. So I'm gonna explain the framework here. And, uh, and then I'm gonna ask you all that question about your calling. Uh, so the, the framework is uh, from Andy Grove. He was chairman and CEO of Intel for a long time. And he came up with this framework called the strategic dissonance model. And he applied it to Intel and how Intel could change because they were in the memory business. They created DRAMs and then the whole computer industry changed and went to microprocessors and they had a hard time changing. So he basically created this model to do it. Um, and to set it up, um, and, and it particularly fo focuses on how do, you, how do you adapt strategy in a fast changing environment, fast changing industry. So there's growth along the X -axis, or Y axis and time along the X axis. And the old paradigm of journalism, century ago, grew, and it grew through the mid-1990s to this inflection point. And all of us know that very well, what happened in the mid-1990s. In fact, in Paul Jones's class just uh, uh, a couple hours ago, he was talking about 1993 and, and how he was trying to talk to newspapers about all the changes that are going on. So it's right in the mid-90s that this happened. And, in, and the inflection point is where uh, one set of industry dynamics begins to give way to another set of industry dynamics. But, but it's not really clear what the consequences of that are yet. Uh, and, and the industry lock-ins I have here, the industry lock-ins back, back in the day, everybody knows this well, is that 
you know, it was around geographical constraints for news and around physical distribution and the expertise around that. And that created monopolies because it had uh, lock-ins that gave companies competitive advantage. So, and then after the inflection point, you either adapt or you don't adapt. And if you don't adapt, you go down. If you do adapt, you go up. So the question is how do you adapt and what do you adapt to? And then the other key thing is that there's a strategic recognition point, and you can see that's 10 years later. And that's important because it counters what Clay is saying. Clay is saying, you know, seeing Glacier 10 miles off and deciding not to move. It takes a long time. It can take 10 years. It can take a decade before you have strategic recognition. And, and, and I, I like this definition, so I put it in there. It's identifying the importance of emerging practices that started in the mid-1990s after they arise, but before unequivocal environmental feedback is available to make their significance obvious. Because once their significance is obvious, everybody's doing it, right? So you're trying to get ahead of that um, so that you can change your strategy and adapt. So there's this dissonance gap. He calls it this dissonance gap. And I love this because I did diversity work and I love the idea that dissonance creates opportunity. Uh, and dissonance is where you have diverging ideas and there's conflicting opinions, which we've all seen. But that is exactly where you look to find the opportunities uh, to go forward. So the tyranny of should is one of the things that, key, that makes this dissonant gap lag so much. And that is like around Intel, Intel said we should be a better memory company. And it took them, I mean many industries have taken 10 years to change. They were like, we're good at memory, we should be a DRAM company. And then all of a sudden it went down to 2% market share before they made significant changes and then finally said, okay, we're a microprocessing company and made those changes. But we see shoulds in all other sorts of places. People should reduce their carbon footprint, everyone should use co a composting toilet, at least my neighbor thinks everybody should use a composting <laughs> toilet. Uh, news, even in this industry, news should be balanced. You could hear people say that. People should value the expertise we have to offer. I know as a photographer now, I take pictures and they just, people throw around IP all over the place and I'm like, there's a skill to taking pictures. <laughs> like, I wish that, you know, people would appreciate it. But now you just throw up all sorts of pictures. Uh, or government should intervene to save newspapers. That's a big theory that's out now. And so I want to give credit to Julia for this because Julia, raise your hand Julia, she's a teacher here and she's in communication studies. Uh, whenever she, I ask her for feedback a bunch on things, she'll always circle the shoulds on my paper. You know, you, know, you can't say should, you, know, you should do it, just do it. Um, so then I came up with this tyranny of should thing. So shoulds come from deeply held beliefs about how the world should be, but shoulds are also a trap. They can block change. So today, Individual consumers have greater power. That's a big thing, and I'll cover some of these other trends uh, in a minute. But, and demand has risen for individually relevant information. You've heard about personalized news. All this means, and, and other trends, mean <coughs> that media organizations will win by meeting people where they are, not where they should be. So this whole orientation in this framework is really going that direction. And then I'll set this up and I'll ask you all that question. So how do we turn dissonance into action? So dissonance is a nice theoretical idea, but actually, tactically, how do we turn it into action? And there are four questions and they center around this, this matrices here. Um, and then, and we'll also, I'll actually turn these questions around to you in each of the sections and then just highlight a couple findings that we had. So the first one is how is the competitive landscape changing? What are the competitive forces that are changing? So think about that because I want to ask you all what you all think about that. The second is what new capabilities are needed to succeed in that new competitive landscape? Because the old capabilities we stood on for a while might not be as relevant for competitive advantage anymore. So the cause of divergence between these is how we identify the dissonance. And that happens because they evolve independently. The competitive landscape and the, the capabilities an organization have evolve on different paths and have different timings, so they get out of alignment. So when you're a publisher or a leader of an organization, it's about kind of monitoring what the capabilities your organization is rel relative to the competitive landscape. And then there's inertia of existing models, but there's also new opportunities in the margins. A lot of times by accident they happen, and they bubble up and you're like, wow, this actually is a competency, this is a capability, and it might give us a competitive advantage. And so you can begin to identify those. So I'll get actually very specific here um, with one, because I'll cover some other trends later. 
So new abundance of information, that's one of the characteristics of the new competitive landscape. It's all about abundance. There's so much out there. There's information overflow. There's you know, issues covered from every angle. We have so much information. There's in this information overload. So it's all about new abundances. So in the capabilities, what that does is that newspapers used to have a deep bench of reporters, uh, 200 reporters in a newsroom, and they had expertise, they had beats, and it was about coverage. It's like a watchtower, and, and the organization was responsible for watching everything that happened below it and reporting on it. So you had that responsibility, but that responsibility goes down with information abundance because it's being covered in many different ways, through many different sources. It doesn't mean you can't, don't cover anymore, co do coverage anymore, but it just means it goes down as a competitive advantage. Uh, the need for balancing points of view goes down. It's still important to balance points of view, but it goes down in terms of responsibility and as a competency that gives you strategic advantage. But aggregating and targeting niches goes up, and ability to engage audiences goes up <coughs> as a capability. So that's an example. So the next two questions are on this axis, and it's sources of value. What are the sources of value that will lead to business models that succeed? And the question is, what needs can be met, problems solved, or desires fulfilled? And this is from paying customers, because businesses at the end of the day are about paying customers. Now that can be a third parties like foundations, philanthropy, or government, uh, but it's still about paying customers. So what, what needs can be met, problem solved, or desires fulfilled? And the next one is how to structure media organizations to capture that value. And I've captured in quotes because one of the ahas in business school I had was that uh, there's a difference between capturing, creating value and capturing value. And, and I was like, you just, I came from nonprofits, you just create value, somebody will give you money. But you actually have to capture that value. Uh, and, and so a lot of it's around structuring business models to capture value. And so the causes of divergence here are understanding customers, which a lot of news organizations don't. That was one of the things we got from our interviews. Uh, just a lot of critique about understanding customers. Beliefs about historical success in, in your industry. Um, what worked before should work, should work in, in the future. Uh, and that's tied to career tracks, emotional attachment, uh, corporate identity issues. Uh, and then also the consequences of what you can change to are unclear. And when consequences are unclear on where you would leap to, you're less likely to make those leaps. And then, of course, the tyranny of should that can be a block. So I, um, I'm going to ask you all a question, but, but first, real quick, how, how many people actually worked as journalists? I'm kind of curious because there's a mix of folks here worked as journalists. OK, and then uh, how many people work in journalism, whether you say work as journalists? And if you teach here, you work in journalist, uh, journalism. Right, OK. Yeah, can teaching or you're in the field of journalism. OK, because we have some folks that came from other departments. OK, a lot of folks. So. Um, so I actually want you to just really quickly, three minutes each, turn to the person next to you, maybe the person that you don't know, if there's an option between somebody you know better or not, and just three minutes each, answer this question. What is one of, the, one of your first memories of wanting to be in journalism or media? And for folks that didn't raise their hand on any of those questions, uh, just answer, why do you do what you do? <laughs> Uh, because that's what it is. It's like, what do you do with you? Trying to get to the core of why do you do it. So three minutes each, and I'll actually start my little timer. When the phone goes off, switch, okay? So um, we're going to get back going again. It was cool to hear a couple of stories from folks. So this, uh, we have this, uh, I have this quote leading the, uh, the whole report uh, because I feel like it nails a bunch of things. Um, and then that, there may be distinctions between professionals and amateurs, between breaking news and follow-up pieces, between long or short, and so forth. But these are just artifacts of production methods rather than deep truths. And we have to be truth tellers. He starts out that quote actually saying, and I was trying to pare it down, he started saying, no history has existed without storytellers. And journalists are storytellers and need to be truth tellers. And so to me, this got to like the, the heart, the essence of why we do what we do. So I asked that question to sort of put us back into that space about why journalism and media is important. One of the uh, inter folks we interviewed uh, at the Pointer Institute uh, at one point said a flip remark, but it sort of stuck with me. She said, so what? So what will media do for people? Like that should be your question uh, for strategy. 
And, and then even though it felt flip, it felt like, okay, that, there is something there, like the so what question, because all the, the school, everything we do, all the way newspapers are set up, all these are just artifacts of production methods. And we have to be truth tellers. So how do we get back to that? Because that's what's core. And, then, and, and how, how do we build the models and build the structures that will take that into the future? So I'm going to, for each of these sections, although I'm going to cover some information in the report, I'm gonna, I want to start and just put up some bullets from f folks answering this question. What you see, because I know right here I just met Paul and Michael, and Paul, Michael does advertising law, and Paul does, he's a co in copywriting, but he does social network stuff. Uh, and so, like, I know you're just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the expertise in this room. So I would love just to hear you all answer the question, what's, con what's changing about the competitive landscape? What's shifting? The most fundamental shifts. Yeah. One, one of the things that I, I don't always hear a lot in the discussion that I think is important and it kind of does get back to the good <coughs> point, but I think, it's, I think it's relevant to me here, is that people consume tons and tons and tons of media and pay billions and billions of dollars, you know, video games and all this stuff. And to me, that the question I'd like to, I'd like to hear and the discussion I'd like to hear a little bit more is we talk about journalism and press as having this really core important function of educating us as citizens in a self-democracy. And of course, a lot of people choose not to, to do that. Hmm. But I see that as a kind of a should sort of a thing. Hmm. And it, it, it's, it's such a complex issue to me because people are making choices you know, not to do that, not to seek that content out. And it's, as you pointed out, it's, it's out there. You can mm -hmm. read as much as you want to read about any issue that you want to read. But people make all kinds of other choices. And so how, how do we, kind of as a society, um, get people to remember that that's important? Mm -hmm. And then how does journalism, the press, whatever form it might take, uh, kind, of, kind of focus on that core mission? Great, I'll put that up if this feels like it's bulleting your good explanation. Uh, willingness to pay and then slash val like society value is sort of like the question around people's willingness to pay for that, right? Because a lot of it, the, that, that's the whole sources of value to business model is that the, the sort, there's value and those are sources of value and then it has to be connected to capturing money that makes it happen. So, and that's the economics around willingness to pay. Value for society. So who else has something, uh, another thing to add? And also, just because we're lacking time, if you feel like somebody kind of covered what you're going to say, you don't need to repeat it. So we can fill in as many gaps as, yeah. And we'll say your name, too. And yeah. yeah. Um, I think that now that everybody is a publisher, mm -hmm. a big question is, what, does the, what do the traditional media have to offer ah, that okay. other people aren't Okay. Uh, traditional media. So next, yeah, right here. Uh, this may be an audience thing. Uh, there is uh, so many choices, but so little time. Hmm. Okay. Uh, over choice. I'll do over choice. Or maybe information yeah. overload. Yeah, information overload. So I'll put that. That can be an information overload too. Okay, yeah. Uh, John, my kids come at media through search engines as opposed to consuming it, lingering on it, and they just uh, don't buy into a lot of traditional media. Hmm. So they, they actually search, they have intent, they search for news, or that it... For it. Okay. Like, why look at a newspaper when you can just go to Google? Yeah. Is there one of the yeah. trends, trend lines that just passed is more people, uh, this you just have a study, more people go to find news by Twitter and Facebook than by social media. Oh, behind again. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, there's one quote that's in the report, and it actually came from a New York Times story, and they had a focus group, and a young person, a Facebook uh, young person, said, uh, if it's news, it'll find me. Like, the, he didn't go find news. He said, if it's news, it'll find me. And I think that sort of so emblematic of what's going on. Who has uh, any other sort of gaps to fill with things? Yeah. Hi, Tommy. My name is Joe Bob. Um, hey. You mentioned earlier the understanding consumers that the media don't understand the consumers. One of the consumers that they don't understand are the advertisers. 
The advertising So can I put that as advertising disintermediation? That's a long <laughs> word, but that's sort of what it is. Advertisers don't have the same linear relationship to media companies. That's a big thing around. Yeah. Dis. <laughs> so, who else has something? Yeah. Really? What was your name? Queenie. Queenie. When I think of the convenience factor, like years ago, I never. I was so in love with the feel of a newspaper, and mm -hmm. now with e-readers, I can virtually get the mm. feel of a newspaper. Is it convenience like uh, that? It's immediate, that it's fast, or it convenience that it's you always have it with you, like it's mobile. You can always have it with you. You can uh, view it when you want to. Great. Any other any other burning ones you feel like aren't there? I'll cover some in a minute. Okay. So so this was one quote that also stuck out to me from David Weinberger at Harvard. He said, "There's no more mainstream." Uh, and and this report was for independent media makers, and so their position is that they sort of fought to get mainstream media to pay attention. And the competition in the old paradigm for journalism was big companies would compete against each other to maintain their dominance, maintain their share. But there's no more mainstream. It's too fragmented now. Uh, and that changes the dynamics a lot, both for mainstream, for formerly mainstream and also for independent media. And these are just little stats uh, around it. Uh, if folks can't read it, I'll, I'll read it out, which is uh, the highest rated uh, network TV show has far fewer viewers than 15 highest rated shows in a typical year in the 1970s. That's just one simple example of how, what's happened to media overall. Uh, and then Weinberger also said, we want quality content, but the, ten uh, but, but, but the ten tendency is against, I have a typo in there, okay, copy editor. <laughs> Uh, it's against going to a single place to find it. So we pull it in. It's a little bit like the search engine stuff. So the basis for competition has changed due to shifts that underlie the basic principle of supply and demand. So it's about abund abundances, which I mentioned before, abundances and scarcities, those two things. Uh, and, and Chris, um, uh, what's his name? Wired Magazine editor? Anderson. Chris Anderson talks a lot about this. So uh, supply so far exceeds demand that the price of news has dropped to zero. And um, the, the key thing here that I think that was my aha, the first one's more of an obvious point, but the second is that because the physical limitations aren't there, the distribution economics have turned on its head. And to illustrate this, I'll have two little diagrams. The old model, you can think of almost like, and this is just not with news, I'm talking about business in general. You would sell 1% of your products uh, you would give away 1% of your products as samples, like perfume samples in a mall, to sell 90% of your product. Now that's flipped, and we have freemium that you've heard of, but there's a dynamic, other dynamic that goes on here. So you actually give away 80% of your product, 90% of your product, to sell 10% of your product. Flickr does that. You go to Flickr Pro, you pay for premium service, but it's mostly free. But the problem is that this creates a positive feedback loop. And in any system, this is from the Daniela Meadows stuff, any system you have positive feedback loops, like the more babies that are born, the more babies get born in the world. The more money you have, the more money you can get. And there's negative feedback loops that correct systems, like government policies, and those corrective loops, they both need to work together. If you have a positive feedback loop, uh, it'll ultimately just, like, a system will destroy itself with a positive feedback loop. Uh, and that is that when you have to create 90% free, free to sell 10% of your products, you, the, the, you get into this competition of the more you give away for free, the more you have to give away for free in order to compete. And what does that do to information overload? That gives us more information and more tools and more things. So it just, it, it's like it's a race to the bottom uh, for a lot of things. So there will be corrective feedback loops that come back into play. Like there's this whole, like Rupert Murdoch and all these folks are now trying to put up paywalls uh, and use. Those are corrective feedback loops to a certain degree. They can work that way. So abundance in advertising. You can say something about this probably in advertising, Michael. Uh, so there's this great thing the Wall Street Journal said, what does the internet display ad market have in common with Zimbabwe? And it said both are printing nearly limitless amounts of their main currency, vastly diminishing the value and undermining their future. The woman who was head of Martha Stewart Media actually was famously criticized for, uh, criticized her peers for selling ad inventory as pork bellies. Uh, they were just giving it away. 
And then abundance of voices. Before we worried about people not having voices, communities not being heard, and they try to get a newspaper and you talk about people not having a voice. Now everybody has a voice. Anybody can have a voice. There's an overabundancy of voices. So scarcities. So it used to be time and money, but and this is this is what Chris Anderson talks about a lot. Is it's now attention and reputation, and he says, which economy are you playing in? So scarcity of attention. We have abundance of news sources. It, it leads to greater scarcity of attention, and and so the mediation is switching. It's no longer the media company is the mediator. The place of control is switching to search and filtering. And that's why Google has so much power, but even Twitter and other sorts of things. So that's a shift, that's a competitive landscape thing. So there's scarcity of reputation. So these are some business models that are built on reputation. Poop, Google PageRank, eBay, the reputation uh, of sellers. Kiva, which is a micro lending thing. Dig and stumble upon for news. And News Trust, which if you all don't know is a, is a sort of small startup that's doing a lot around reputational stuff. Um, and, but the thing is reputation is more fragile than time and money and attention, which is as a key thing. And for news organizations, there's been a lot of research about believability ratings in news organizations. But there's an opportunity, I think, particularly with advertisers, and you can say there's disintermediation with, with advertising, but there's this opportunity uh, because people still don't, they, they want control of their information and to trust it to an advertiser, there's a relationship there that will be always hard to bridge. And if publications and media organizations can be that broker, that trusted broker of personal information, People do want to get information from advertising. They, th that's how they find out about products and services, but they don't want to trust advertisers with that information. And so there's something there to be worked out that there's an opportunity around. So the future of media would be, and this is, relates to the convenience thing, the future of media for me would be the type of content I want anytime, anywhere, on any device. And then this is Ashish Sony. He's uh, in, at the uh, engineering school at USC. So there's de device proliferation, it exacerbates the overabundance of information, and platform convergence. And so the media organizations that make it easiest for people to consume, convenience factor, any type of information on any platform will win. And people have been talking about we're going into a post-platform economy. Um, so the idea of even television will be an anachronism. Excuse me a second. Yeah. We've been talking about that for 15 years, and quite frankly, that convergence never happened. They kept, they just missed each other. Uh, it, now we're talking about the number of different screens, uh, meaning that television still does mean something. It just depends on which screen you're looking at. I mean, isn't that sort of old thinking right there? Well, I think it's just in hypergear. I mean, like just in the last year and a half, I watch all my TV on iTunes. It's still a TV. Yeah, so, yeah, so, okay, so it's still TV, but I wouldn't, it, it's not in terms of... It's been broadcast television for a long time, you watch cable, it's mm -hmm. all television. Yeah, but we we, we thought that there was going to be this big convergence, right. and there hasn't been. What do other people think about that? There's definitely some, this is in the new, real, or in the emerging, rea or existing reality sort of section, so it's about uh, characterizing the competitive landscape, and so I think that it, it might not be happening as much, but there are tales of some of that happening and it's still affecting some competitive dynamics. But how much, I don't know, I'd turn that over to you all. Yeah. I don't know if it's, uh, I'm sorry, Tony, I'm yeah. Ryan Palmer. It's, I think it's more about uh, this aggregation of the platform than anything else. So there's, there used to be that the box defined television and now it's disaggregation of the programming content as well as the, the dissemination you know, methods. And that that, that that means the television doesn't mean the same thing. That, now some people still do get appointment viewing, and so a lot of people still get a full appointment viewing on a box called a television, but more and more get the same content that's disaggregated and time across shared. different platforms. Yeah, and time shared. Time well, shift, I think, is probably, time shift and location shift are probably good. But I would even push it into the content, the structure of content itself. Uh, the, the Henry Jenkins talks a lot about transmedia storytelling. And it's the whole idea, like Heroes does it, and Lost, the TV show Lost does it. And there's all these conspiracy blogs that you follow, like what's happening on the island, what, all this backstory. And then it's going into gaming, stuff like So there's these different portals into reality uh, that you take that content. And that, I would say, is cross-platform. It's not just about a disintermedi disintermediation or just watching TV on your iPhone. Uh, I mean, it's definitely, it doesn't happen overnight. So that's convergence. It's, that's plot divergence. It's 
different plot Pl precise, going to different precise different places. We but the media property same place and it's not known to the that's, right. Yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say the media property uh, itself is not diverse. The media property is across that's all right. these so things. Yeah. yeah. So it's just I guess the point is that it's not clearly defined. Before people would be trained around like radio and you'd know radio and you know how to sell radio ads and, and even in, in newspapers like I did a case study on Mother Jones and there was like we used to have a rate sheet and we'd say how much a front page ad is and the half page ad and it was static it stayed the same but now it's constantly changing you create a different performance based ads interstitial ads and you have to always de innovate those sort of things so it creates a whole different skill set when you're pushed into putting it on other platforms. Um, so, and all this gets back to then the whole thing about it's connecting the competitive landscape to the competencies. So, whatever you're describing, regardless of how I'm labeling it here, what are the competencies to succeed in that? Um, so, uh, this I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk much about, but it's the changing their graphics that we talked about. Somebody brought that up. Uh, and the next phase of globalization, which I'd say, uh, you know, the Guardian has more readers than uh, in the U.S. than the U.K. So that's an op that, th that's an opportunity in terms of reaching a bigger market. But the threat is that as soon as you have a global market, uh, you have the single market, and there's redundancy. And when there's redundant capacity, that capacity can diminish, particularly when it comes to people. Um, and there's also a sharp rise in uh, nation-state filtering and censorship, uh, which is denial of service and all that sort of stuff. So that's something I think to pay attention to. So I think I have one more slide on this. Um, people are increasingly acting on their own, free of institutions. And I think these two are really important for newspapers. We had this debate in the consortium about how uh, you know, people don't care about institutions anymore. They're not affiliated with the brands uh, as much. Uh, and I think it comes from these, these two things, which is um, people are acting free of institutions. You had the whole Robert Putnam stuff, bowling alone. He said civic uh, uh, social capital declined because people are affiliated with formal institutions. And a lot of people are saying that's actually not true. People are more civically involved. It's just informal. It's not with formal institutions. Um, and, that, and there's a lot of studies. There's a study from the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication about how social networks have actually increased social capital. So, and then readers are not tied to publishers. Uh, this, the Pew had a study that said only 25% of casual news readers trust just a few sources more than others. That's a small percentage. Uh, before people would take the New York Times, they'd just get the New York Times. Now I trust if I get a referral link from a friend and they say, like, if Ed Skloot sends something and he says, read this because of this, 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 I'll read it no matter what source it comes from and I'll trust it. So, okay, this, um, the long tail, people have talked about the long tail a bunch in new media. And so I actually want to flip that on its head and say it's actually mirage. Um, the, did, did, did folks know what power law is? Uh, power law is that, like the 80-20 rule or the rich get richer rule. Um, and so just to summarize the long tail, uh, if you take uh, Amazon's inventory and you say 20% of their inventory is uh, sells the most and 80% is the long tail and Chris Anderson's whole thing was that you can actually monetize that long tail even if you only sell three books if you sell enough of those three book units you'll be able to make money but the whole thing I think <coughs> for, for media producers is that it doesn't it's it, it doesn't serve media producers well it serves big companies that can aggregate lots of content at small marginal costs. They have a huge inventory and they can, like Amazon, have a huge bookstore. But if you're a media producer and it takes a lot of shoe leather to make something, you're not going to make an, you're not going to make the money back to produce that anymore, um, particularly when it comes to investigative journalism. And also news goes out of date quickly, so that long tail is a lot shorter. There's been some research about how the, the tail will likely be more extremely flat than Chris Anderson talks about, and the appetite for blockbusters will grow. There's an HBR article about investing in the long tail and whether companies should invest in the long tail. So the opportunity here for uh, media companies is that, is that new platforms create new stars. We've seen it on YouTube and Twitter. You get in there and if you're first mover on it, you're a YouTube star and a Twitter star. A media company can become dominant. They can use their existing user base, but if they move fast, they can become a new star, which creates volatility. And that volatility is the volatility that allows producers to get in, uh, the new players, new media companies, to get into that 
when a new platform comes along and there'll be another Twitter and there'll be another YouTube, if you get in there first and you dominate with stuff, you'll have power law. You'll, it's like the, the rich get richer, more babies that you have, the more babies you'll have. It's that positive feedback loop. But it's taking advantage of that volatility and acting quick. So a lot of people say, uh, Twitter, it's like, I don't know if it's a trend, it's not gonna last. You know, it pays to be first mover on that, whether or not it's a trend in the, you know, later on. You, if you're first mover and you have a lot of followers, it'll cascade, it'll cascade into more, more power and more reach. So cyber cascades. Cyber, you all probably know about social cascades, uh, which is that uh, social cascades are all about how information spreads socially. Uh, cyber cascades, Cass Sunstein talks about how it's basically social cascades on steroids. And that's important because super distribution is the new mainstream. Um, super distribution is about spreading digital products free of physical distribution limits. But the key characteristic is that, in the, in the Boston Globe, pre-story is a good example of this, that a single story can hurdle the entire readership of the original publication. So the Boston Globe, when the pre-scandal came out, that one story hurdled the entire circulation of the newspaper. Uh, but the thing is that super distribution is more unpredictable, more volatile, um, and that, um, and yeah, it's, it's more volatile. So it actually, the, this, this is where I, uh, the first time I've talking about this, so I'm like forming it in my head. Uh, so individual decisions um, aren't simply like following the way the market works. Uh, it, it's a little bit unpredictable. And there's been studies about popular music. Well, I won't, I won't go into that. There's, it, it's just basically not predictable. You can't predict based on quality which things are going to be uh, most popular. So. A good example of that is the Talking Points Memo, where your where yeah. where your people did a press release this morning that says Talking Points Memo audience up seventy nine percent in March, readers driving growth of social media and sharing. That's a pretty good size increase there. Yeah. Totally. So now into the next one. So I want to turn it around to you all. What are the new competencies? Um, and I have dis distinctive competencies because it's not just about doing something. It's, it has to be competitive advantage comes from distinctive competencies. Can I back up a second yeah. and ask a question? Sure. What you were talking about before in terms of the speeded up distribution and <coughs> how does that and the whole concept of trust work together? A whole. I mean, you were saying, you know, if, if somebody sent something out, you would trust it. Didn't matter where it came from. But if you have sort of super distribution and how does, how does the concept of people actually trusting that information work then with super distribution? Wouldn't it seem to, it seems like the level of trust would be lower, but. Well, it could be, but like, so, it, like if, uh, if, Jul if Julia sent me something, I trust that if she vetted it and she thought it's relevant to me and it's good information, I would read it and trust it. You have different friends who sort of vet the official. Yeah, well, people, like some friends might send you stuff and you're like, I don't know if I trust what that person's. You, like, you know what, you, what friends you would trust, right? And I trust my friends more than the New York Times. Like, you know, I mean, the New York Times is good, but it, uh, you know, it has slants on things and there are holes in things and sometimes it's not so transparent to tell. Um, so, and I, but you do trust it. I don't think it's either, either or. It just becomes more complex. Before the authority rested in the publication more. Now the authority is distributed uh, through links and through, you know, in Twitter it's about dipping your toe in the stream and if you see a bunch of people you trust mentioning something that's really important then it builds a pattern and you're like, oh, okay, there's a lot of people paying attention to this or caring about this. That gives you your own assessment. You pull that in and, and decide what trust you'll place on it. And you also have a handful of friends who check it all out on Snopes and alert everybody else if something is false. Yeah, they need yeah. to so this is a study that uh, was done at Penn State, I use in my class, by uh, Sham Sundar about uh, source attribution and news. And he does just briefly, he's Sri's advisor, but he did a, a thing about where everybody got the same stories, but they were told they came from different places. Professional editors were at the bottom. The top was random people who were in the room before. <laughs> Everybody got the same stories. He's Dan Wright's student also. Yeah. We have a three generation. So there you are, yeah, right here in the but it's a pretty interesting study which I commend to you. And in information science we had some people that were also wondering about this referral thing and two or three of the research questions about whether people would take referrals over their even their own searches. 
they were always taking referrals. So what, uh, what competencies do you think are key going forward? And this is Ryan, you all are in education, like what are you teaching people? Yeah. Let me frame it as a source of confusion. I had a former student who was a very successful film director in this term, and he doesn't much like the internet. Of course, at his pay scale and with his deep knowledge of television and film, he doesn't need it to make a living. My problem is, what do you teach a beginner who could go in 19 different directions now? Hmm. So my issue isn't what new captain. At the top end of all of these, there will be experts in each of them who will make very good living. It's how you frame all of these platforms for hmm. a beginner so they can trundle out in some kind of survival mode and find their way. Because they're not an expert in, in, in any one of them. And so which one do you sample them in? Which, how do you get hmm. them started? Paul said earlier, our challenge is to Education so they can get a job in one year, but do a year five. Yeah, pretty much. They have the smarts to, they have the equipment to see what it is to be, to see five years ahead in which they should be a leader, but also to get in positions where they can have their first job. That's really our challenge. How do we, how do we put the media skills yet uh, a way of seeing a path to some sort of future? And it might be a highly divergent series. Yeah, it's just I mean, for that matter, it's probably smarter. <laughs> Uh, but so what? I think every professional school faces that for a profession that's in chaos faces it more. So what other competencies? What else are you, you think you should teach your students? Yeah. I don't know if this is exactly a competency, but I think that it's more important than ever for people to be creative. Hmm. I mean, Why? We always think about that. We used to think about training somebody to be a school board supporter. You know, we wanted them to be smart and ask hard questions. So creative versus block and tackle. We've been talking a little mm -hmm. bit about teaching students to pitch stories. Like we always sort of told them what the story was in some ways and said, okay, go cover this and this is sort of what your story ought to look like. And I was talking to a couple of reporting people the other day and one said, well, you know, we need to teach students to to brainstorm and create story ideas and then pitch them because they have to be more entrepreneurial and it's going to be more individual kind of environment and they have yeah. to be able to get somebody to believe in the story as opposed to getting assigned to them. So entrepreneurial, would that, would that be one? It was a tweet about that. It would be very much a newspaper, -y, you know, car crash kills two and I-40 kind of mm -hmm. um, headline. It had no personality, it had no feel, it had no tone. Um, and I realized I don't want this. I want to tell people who are more carefully selecting the information and then writing in a way that will make me kind of lure me into clicking to find out more. A more personal touch, maybe like how it affect me. Uh, maybe it's, it's a funny story, write it in, in a humorous kind of way. Um, and so I have students in my class talk about this and show them examples of with Twitter um, from new sites and um, that have not gone to their hometown newspaper or TV station's website and find more stories. And they, they tweet them mm -hmm. um, with a little link to the story and all those kinds of things. Um, and the students love that assignment more than anything else in the whole editing class the entire semester. Um, they love yeah. it to write in their own kind of voice, but also within the confines of news as well. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's that personal touch that will make, that makes people on Twitter and Facebook separates those from just sort of generic news churners. Yeah, totally. Thanks for describing that. Yeah, let's take you, you two and then we'll go on. I don't think it's a new capability, but I think the ability to think. What was your name? What was your, what was your name? Sorry. Tom. Tom, okay. To, to think and write well. To okay. think clearly and write well. Because you can have all the new technical tools, but if you can't think clearly and write well, it's useless. Anybody disagree with that? Okay. Andy yeah. actually touched on something that writing styles change tremendously in each different context. Yeah. So he pointed that out in Twitter, but it's also true. We the past uh, studies that Laura and other people have done shows that if you're not, if your first paragraph doesn't cover it, or if you're not writing in points, as you see CNN do, 
yeah. people go, people don't read straight down, they read. Yeah, I, I um, had um, um, met with a mentor last night and he was, we were talking about information overload and he goes, you know, if somebody sends me a, an email and they use the letter U instead of Y-O-U, I immediately judge them and discount them. Um, and he's from a, like an older generation, so I, then I sent him a little email saying, thanks, it was great to see you with like an A, great to see you <laughs> like, at, uh, afterwards. But uh, one of the things in the report, it, it, there's a bunch around how it's changing our our way of writing, and not only our way of reading, but reporters too. And there was a study, uh, this guy looked at Nietzsche and, and Nietzsche's whole body of work and marked a point in time when he switched from writing longhand to writing with a typewriter. And he has this line, he says he went from writing arguments to aphorisms when he did that. Uh, and that is, as a, being a metaphor for now, what's happening with Twitter and everything else. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you can be judgmental about it, but that might be the way things are going. So let's, uh, go, one that's over here and then. That's a terrible yeah. thing to ask at yeah. this point. But what exactly is the the question's right up here. What new capabilities are needed to succeed? And this is related to the competitive environment. Like what, it's not just, it's not that it should. It's, it's not, not what we think they should have. What's gonna succeed in the competitive environment that we painted? Yeah. I, I think with all of the information overload, I think it's increasingly important. I don't know if this is new capabilities, but enhanced capabilities to take this anecdotal bullet style of presenting information, which I seem to see a lot of, and place that in, to, to synthesize that into mm. a broader picture so that people have a better understanding, place it in context of global issues or national issues or state issues or local issues. And, and that's value added to all of this random so it's like being curators. So like there was a guy named Andy Sullivan who does uh, the dish thing, and he did this whole thing of uh, curating the tweets that came in from Iran because there was so much and it was hard to tell what was valid information and what was good. And yeah, so it's like that th synthesis and curation yeah, of that. Uh, yeah, and there was somebody, yeah. I just wanted to mention too, we've talked about having you know, excellent writing and editing skills and all of that, but I think there's, we also need to broaden the understanding that so many of the needs of communication not with written word anymore. You know, we're mm. talking about, yeah. you know, visuals and with, you know, interactives and other ways. I mean, writing certainly is a strong component to that, but to expand that so that people understand that storytelling is becoming an important, you know, not just the written word. There was a, a bunch of people that were saying we're moving back into an, uh, a visual auditory culture from a text culture now, and that video and audio is going to do the cultural heavy lifting going forward. Uh, so a lot of people have said that. Not, not that that's the right way, but yeah. Well, I know that's boring, but just to amplify sort of what Laura said, I think with all of the things that we say about them being entrepreneurial and all of that, to succeed, you still do need a sort of basket of basic skills. Yeah. Well, yeah, what are those basic skills? What are those basic skills not based on what we've, you've done before, but right. based on the new competitive environment? So I'm going I'm to move on, and I'm going to go through these. Fairly quickly. So um, we heard this over and over from folks we talked to. The primary product of journalism is no longer content, but community. Um, and that's because content's getting cheap, and, and, and it's hard to make enough money from it. But the connections among folks is what you can monetize. Um, so getting serious about community. It's not just about uh, making somebody a member. It's about shared products, projects and people coming together. So this is a very liberal thing, but it's an example. In the UK, they did these. Uh, these bus campaigns that said, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Uh, and it was a spontaneous thing that happened really quick. They raised like 180,000 uh, pounds or euros and, um, and they had it like on buses all over the UK and then it spread around, around the world. So that was users coming together around a particular zeitgeist thing. Um, and so that's an example. So, the two skills that I think are co connected to this are community organizing. There's a woman named Amanda Michael at the Huffington Post. She did Off the Bus, and it was very much like citizen journalism thing. And she said, I'm not trained as a journalist. I came from community organizing. Uh, and so those are the skills that she was using. And then something that was related to the personal and the POV thing that Andy was talking about. Uh, there was a guy at the Washington Post. I forgot his name. Krim, maybe you all know him. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And he, uh, he, said he t uh, termed this thing declarative reporting. Um, and, and it was all about reporters declaring a point of view, being personal, saying what their point of view is, but giving that context because it gives people an emotional connection. Um, 
So adaptive reporting is another sort of extension of that. And that's not only just declaring a point of view, but real time getting reactions from, uh, from users and readers and adapting uh, and engaging them. So I'm going to skip that for time. So most company and organizations I see don't have the ability to use technology strategically. Um, so one of the things that Vilvia and Schiller said was that uh, the biggest lesson she learned from NewYorkTimes.com was that she merged the role of technologists and journalists. She put the techies in the newsroom and treated them as journalists. Um, and she said you can design entire new news experiences that way. And, um, and also experiments are really important. Rapid, low-cost innovation, uh, just doing prototyping and putting things out there and seeing what sort of traction happens. Um, and experimentation, um, which you need to do at a low cost. Like I, I am an advisor for a film project and they like raised $500,000 to do this experimental storytelling thing in South Africa and I was like, $500,000? Like, you know, you should be able to prototype it and do something for $5,000 and see if it works and then <laughs> raise more money. So I think a lot of the experimentation needs to take on that nature. So counterintuitive ways of working. So um, this actually is an interesting thing. Let's say how Hollywood, when, ho when VCRs first came out, Hollywood fought them. They wanted to tax cassettes. Um, and they ended up losing, but they, they were lucky they lost because movie rental business ended up tripling their revenue to uh, like $12 billion. Um, and so it was non-intuitive, but, but, but but they could have gone into that. So the publications avoided doing hyperlinking for other, like to other sites for a long time because they didn't want it to um, lead viewers away. Um, and then counterintuitive ways of reporting, which is about, like they say enjoyment is the single most ad uh, important attitude about uh, driving news consumption. So things like comedy, a lot of people say, you know, John Stewart's not uh, a journalist or reporter, but he asks harder nose questions than a lot of journalists ask. Um, and they al he also has a, a, a viewership that is more knowledgeable than even CNN viewers. So journalpreneurs, um, this is a, something that Dean Folkart was talking about, entrepreneurship. A lot of folks are saying now that uh, you can be a brand of one, like Andrew Sullivan or somebody else can go out and they can become the publisher, the marketer, they, they take on all the roles that used to be in a publication and they do it themselves. So they're entrepreneur journalists. So teaching those entrepreneurial skills and teaching people how to do all those things instead of having the business like part of your business, the marketing part, the reporting part and keeping them separated, people are wrapping them up into to one role. So new sources of value, where do you think, uh, I want to do a time check here. I'm, I'm realizing that I'm covering a lot of information in the reports there. And, uh, I should have told you that yeah. people will come and go because of classes. So. No, I'm, I'm fine with that. And I get, sort of put it out to give people permission around that. But I also had said that, you know, this is the first time I've talked this out. There's a lot in the reports. 100 page report has a lot of good research in it. Um, and so this is the first time I've put it, like done it like live. <laughs> So I realize it's covering a lot of information and most of the time I spent on this was trying to pare it down to key things. But I also realize too much information is the pro one of the problems we have with media, is me media overload. So how are people around, like we can also talk about the next two questions more in terms of the comments from the room uh, and then the report can be something you all read or what, are you all finding this useful? Okay, okay. So I'll still go on fast so that, that we can finish in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, so what needs can be met, problem solved, and desires fulfilled? So this is new sources of value. What, is, what do people value? What is the market value? What are people that are paying value that will lead to business models that are sustainable? What do users want? Yeah? Don't, don't we all sort of want some degree confirmation of our own worldview? Hmm. And if there's, a, if there's so much media it on. Can't I actually enjoy not having a lot of media I don't like not coming to me? Like I think of the difference between you know O'Reilly and Oprah. Okay, two very clear choices. They're both on at the same time. Clearly I'm gonna watch one rather than the other. And even though they're both on every night at the same time, I will never watch the other. Hmm. Hmm. What do other people think? So that, I'm struck by the quote on the page before where it said that journalists should be community solid, but <coughs> community builders. I mean, that's a, that's a, 
that's a view of journalism that small town publishers had for many, many years and probably yeah. still do. Um, and it seems like the value that comes out of that is that you believe that the person giving you the information or the institution giving you the information cares about what you care about. So there's a joint kind of feeling about what's important. I don't know where that goes exactly. But it's the hyperlocal, but it's like. In information like science, we call that a model that people have. that birds of a feather flock together. But they can be, the Farad Manju's book, True Enough, talks a lot about what degree people will be persuaded away from their core set of beliefs and what beliefs, what percent that there will be sticky, which ones enjoy a challenge and which ones resist a challenge. Um, so I commend that book to you, Manju's. Maggie's pretty good about bringing in a lot of people's research and then popularizing it. He writes for Slate in New York Times when he's not doing that book. So, will, uh, anybody have another response to the community as a as a as a skill? Because that also ties into values. Like, do is that something people value from media organizations or news organizations? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think we're now making a distinction between information and opinion, and I think there is a distinction. It's not all the same in my mind. And so uh, I, I think we talk about what needs can be met. Are we talking opinion needs to have your views reinforced? Or are we talking about a need to find out about the world? Because they're, they're not necessarily the same thing. In small town papers, what they're finding they can do with the internet is to recreate the town square, the country store, where people come together and talk to each other. It intermingles fact and opinion. Sometimes nicely, sometimes not so nicely. But that, that can still be done at the purest form of journalism, it's community journalism, because right. the publisher walks down the street and sees the person whose picture's on the front page, and you have to deal with them. Uh, that sort of, in the small level, I sort of get as community. I don't get it when it gets to the metro. Yeah. Right. I, 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 don't I don't think, think how you do that. that. I don't think democracy can exist out beyond a certain end number of people. I mean, beyond that, it, it gets, it's impossible. Well, com communities are sliced lots of different ways. I mean, you have the progressive community, you have, you know, community of oh, expats, you have yeah. local communities, you have academics. So, are, <laughs> so I think what you guys yeah. are talking about is that it matters in some magic communities is probably pretty useful. Well, if you go back to the 19th yeah. century, if you look at the suffrage newspapers, you will get these women writing who say, uh, you know, I'm so glad to get my newspaper today because it makes me realize that there are people across the country of like mind. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to... That quote I skipped is really good and it is germane to this thing. Oh, yeah, this one. So this is about partisan, like point of view news. Uh, it was from the New Yorker. Europe long ago embraced the notion of competing narratives for different political communities with individual newspapers reflecting the views of each faction. It may not be entirely coincidental that these nations enjoy a level of political engagement that dwarfs the United States. So we're going into, like you say, like Lou Dobbs leaving CNN, or like just the, the political point of view that is coming into news right now. CNN's trying to be balanced, trying to be just information based. They're losing viewers. Fox is going, you know, the viewers are going up. So this is not a matter, it, it's again about the should thing. It's like people should maybe just have access to information, but what do people want? Like, and not that you just give them what they want, but how do you meet their needs, like the convenience factor or some of the other things they want and accomplish some of those things? You have to like meet people where they are. Um, you know, yeah, well you mentioned the yeah. Fox and CNN and then uh, New York Times had a story about it last week. But then we had a, a visitor, a vice president from CNN come here, and I don't know if he's gave me a company line or, or if it's actually the case, but he argued that Fox has, uh, yes, more viewers, but they tend to be the same viewers all the time. They tend to not be uh, of a high uh, uh, income uh, and social class, therefore uh, don't drive revenue as high as the CNN viewers, and that the CNN viewers tend to be uh, greater in number, though they come hmm. at various points in time and therefore are more valued by advertisers. So the CNN is actually making a ton of money, and, and most of their money uh, at this point is, or, or an increasing amount of money is coming from their online sites. Hmm. So, so, you know, this Fox-CNN dichotomy 
that's often cited by the media is not necessarily true. The fact that's that a good the, that's the a good good point of information. Say, I think that's probably mm -hmm. a trust issue. Yeah. <laughs> well, the so, thing that's getting talked about is prime time, and there's more in terms of making money at CNN than just prime time. Right. The discussion of ratings is prime time. It's not about total day parts nor money uh, being made off of it. The uh, quote you have about the mm. European nations, that's the song that Bob Stevenson sang here for years whenever we would talk about objective journalism. You know, he would always say, well, there are very healthy democracies that don't have that. Yeah. It's less boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's less boring. So what a... It wasn't what you're just discussing, though, the model of American journalism before a lot of our Metro Daily started to go under. And the survivors said, well, we'll get bigger market by being less partisan, by being less narrow. We'll widen our base by this objective journalism thing. It may be that hmm. the, the aberration in history is the, the, the objective journalism. Hmm. That's we're, back to the, we're going back to the way it should be. Yeah. Because of what it is. The way we were. <laughs> it's an interesting thought because the, the quote objective journalism is very short period of time historically and you know as late as the, the 50s I mean objective journalism comes in like in the 1890s and 1900s as a, as a way of attracting more advertisers because you don't want to be so partisan that you drive certain kinds of advertisers away but the publishers were still very partisan had very partisan points of view and of that, that, that was true up through the 50s where you had Publishers who were very politically committed and, and said so, and so this very you know the lend down and don't even vote because that means you're not objective. That's very recent and very uh, hmm. different from the, the, the most patterns internationally and national. So it's really a short period of time that that, that yeah. real objective mantra was the key. So what other things uh, do people value? that would lead to business models. What does the market want? What do people want? What do users want? To be entertained. To be entertained, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I had that thing with John Stewart before. Enjoyment is the key driver for news consumption, for sure. Yeah. A, a yeah. depth of information that we couldn't get before. And, and that... Users want a depth of information? I'm living in Raleigh, North Carolina, I can get everything I need to know about my St. Louis park. Mm, yeah. Whereas it used to take me I used to have to go into the J School library over in Powell two weeks after something happened to read about it the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Yeah. So the depth of community. So that's that can be depth like of yeah, depth of knowledge. Yeah. Good. Depth. So I have immediacy up there. I put this up there so you can read it and I don't have to read it while we're all talking, but uh, immediacy is something that is, uh, a lot of people are demanding now. So this is a huge problem that I think can be solved. It's the information overload. Uh, Clay Shirky said, we had a, fil a set of filters that used to work but are broken now. We, people talk about information overload. So solving filter failure, I think, is something that media companies uh, can add a lot of value that they can monetize and make business models out of. And some of it happens automated, some of it's the experts, the curators, uh, some of it's crowds, um, and it's also curating the crowd, creating like Wikipedia does in terms of having uh, a community design and rules for self-organizing. Um, so, and this is the last one of the sources of value. Um, I have this picture in here because one, one, a good metaphor I heard recently was that uh, new me the, the new pair, uh, a metaphor for new media is like conveyor belt sushi. Have, does anybody have conveyor belt sushi? Where it just comes by really fast and you take what you want out of it. Uh, and I thought that was a, a great metaphor. Um, the, out of everybody, I mean, we talked about community a lot. Everybody we interviewed, everybody in the media consortium, the biggest thing always came back to treating audiences as, as communities and, and to take communities seriously, uh, but to have that be the biggest uh, source of value. So, um, yeah. So the, the last one is business models. So what business models are you all excited about? I, don't, I only have one slide for this, so it goes from lots of slides in the first one to one slide in the end. Um, what, what, what business models do you think have promise that you've seen 
that you teach, case, cases of other organizations, where's their, where's their hope? Anybody? <laughs> Sorry, not with news, but with advertising. With advertising? Yeah. I talked to Craig Newmark and he went, a lot of people have value just being there. A lot of people you <coughs> pay you to be there. So he only charges, the way Craigslist works, is he only charges people who will pay him to be there. Hmm. He doesn't charge people who he would just like to be there. So if you look at, he, he's a perfect example if you give away a lot, take a little bit, mm -hmm. being successful at it. So, like, lots of people who are doing, like, individuals that are doing want ads on Craigslist, no charge. Institutions that want to do a whole bunch of ads, they pay. So, you had your hand back? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking um, that it has to be, in many ways, not necessarily only, but many have to be micro-businesses. Mm. Yeah. Along, along with probably the Googles and the Yahoo's. Yeah. I totally agree. Any other? Yeah. Well, I think if you find a model that crosses a lot of these diverse communities, the one that comes to mind to me is ESPN, because they sell a product that crosses all kinds of divergent communities, hmm. and the people can coalesce there, and they're constantly putting on new, um, new channels, new stuff on the internet, new formats for programming. They, even, they, they, they virtually invented some of the sports that are now in the Olympics. All the snowboarding hmm. and stuff like that came out of the X Games that were created by ESPN about 15 years ago. Now we've got people winning gold. That's why we're winning more gold medals than, or more medals than everybody else because these things <laughs> were positioned in. They were essentially invented by ESPN. Hmm. And they seem to have almost a, a you know, totally flexible marketplace that they can, and they're, they're fairly flexible, they can move, but everybody watches sports in one form or another. If one sport starts to dominate, they just slide over and cover it. Hmm. That's great. You know, th there might even be another extension of that as a metaphor for journalism, is like the best way to win at a game is to invent it. Like if you're the inventor, you're winning the game. So like for journalism, what are the games you can invent? Like well, what's a, a whole new product that doesn't even exist out there that journalism could invent and then win at it. Um, so I'll just uh, summarize. I basically broke it down like an income statement. And the first is uh, expenses. And the first point is what you said around micro businesses. It's running lean and mean. It's not having huge newsrooms. It's being entrepreneurial. Uh, and the ones that, like, I think it's not just nonprofits, but news organizations in general are going to have to be lean and mean. And, uh, and a piece of that is I have producer's compensation here. A lot of people are creating just with like open source software. A lot of people are just creating lots of content because they're getting non-monetary compensation, like reputation or social purpose stuff. And then revenue, it, there's experimenting with new revenue streams. And it'll be the mix of revenue streams that, that will win. So there's not a silver bullet. It's not going to be just advertising. And I'll, and I'll just list the bullet points of some business models in a minute, but it'll actually be having a mix of all of those that's going to be, that's going to work. So the revenue models, uh, there's nonprofit philanthropy model. A lot of folks have talked about the nonprofit model in journalism. And, and Mother Jones actually has been doing that for a long time. 50% earned income, the rest of it uh, comes from philanthropy. And mostly big donors, actually. A lot of people think micro donations are, is going to work, but it can only be, that a lot of times is only like 10% of, uh, of revenue for a nonprofit. So adding distribution channels, free and premium, because adding distribution channels is interesting. There is, uh, I forgot the publication now I wrote down, the one in Europe had their most profitable year last year in newspapers, and it came from this strategy. Uh, does anybody know a big German newspaper? Deep what? Deep Belt, that's their biggest uh, Maybe it's not German. No, uh, it's not. This is where I don't have a tie. Oh, here it is. Axel Springer. Is it? Uh, yeah. The yeah, so they had the highest profit uh, last year. And 14% of the revenue comes from online. And it comes from sub-branding. So they'll source an article. And then they own, through acquisition, a bunch of things, a bunch of other papers, and get, and, and get it out there. Uh, and it's about creating sub-brands where they can repurpose information. Um, so free and premium, we talked about micropayment, micro-fundraising. There are a lot of models for this. Kajingle, Spot Us, if you haven't heard of Spot Us, is a great way of doing like micro-fundraising from community to pay for a story they want to see investigated locally. 
Uh, and in the report, I list a whole bunch of innovators that are to innovators to watch around that. News is a loss leader, and I think this one gets underrated uh, a ton. I mean, newspapers have never made money just from the news they produce. Uh, it's, they've always been a loss leader. You can extend that. There's a newspaper in Norway. The biggest newspaper in Norway has a weight loss club. Um, and you know, you might say, oh, we don't want to get in the weight loss club business, but newspapers don't want to get in the classified <laughs> business or whatever. Like, you use news as a loss leader, and you create other products, whether it's virtual goods. Like, there's a whole lot in the like uh, online now around digital goods, selling like virtual swords and virtual whatever uh, ring chimes or did just digital goods that don't that have any really tangible value. They do have value, but they're not like tangible things. All that stuff can be sold, and you use news as a loss leader to do it. So I think people haven't pushed the envelope on wh what that can do. Uh, and then getting more from advertising, even though it's going way down. The, it's about constant innovation, um, and and I think you know, advertising still grown faster online than it has in TV and radio during their first 14 years. So I still think there's a lot of promise, even though it's been in the downturn. So and then revenue sharing, incentivizing folks to create content. So those 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 are all. There's a bunch of examples in the report around those business models. But it's really about mixing all of these, and then and capturing the value. So I think that is it. I'm not going to cover any more. Um, so any other things you all want to talk about or any questions? Um, on the revenue models, it, it strikes me that if, we, if you look at a mix like this, you, you, if you look at the current structure or the structure 10 years ago, there was also a mix then. There was nonprofit philanthropy pieces. There, there were sort of all these mixes which were there. But the really dominant one was advertising, a combination of advertising and subscription. Subscription, you go way back to colonial days, they paid more in subscription, less in advertising, but it's always that combination one way or another. So when you have new media come along like radio, there was always this period of chaos where everybody was experimenting, and then there was always this kind of rationalization at which the kind of old dominant model took over, which was a combination of advertising and subscriber pay. So if, there's, if, you, if you don't come out of this chaos with that kind of rationalization, then it's a true revolution because there's going to be really a different picture on the other side than we've always seen as we came out of every medium before. So do you think it's going to be a true revolution in that sense, or do you think there's going to be some rationalization that kind of puts us back in the... I'll turn it back to other folks. What do you all think? <laughs> what do folks think about that? Model, yeah. Really hard to wrap your head around, I think. Yeah, I, I don't see subscription working unless uh, the whole antitrust model is upended. In other words, it, unless the the main purveyors of information form cartels and basically uh, connive to uh, prohibit information from the main information sources, would subscription <coughs> take hold? But then that might be supported by, you know, independent, smaller producers providing information for free. But I, I don't, I don't see a subscription model ever making it. Even in success is based on subscription. Subscription to what? Oh, to not the, as the primary. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, your cable bill so high. They get two bucks of stuff per month, many markets, and they're so strong. I mean, that's where the antitrust. Okay. Yeah, I would say it's, sports is definitely an They're making a fortune on subscription. And television finally, it's local television, is finally starting to make money. But they, but they basically are essentially yeah, basically monopolizing the, the, um, the broadcast of various sporting events. I think a lot of it, it depends on the industry. So, like, even Consumer Reports has been successful with a subscription model because. You know, you readers don't want the impeachability of advertising in, in a consumer reports. But the same thing with Cook, Cook, uh, Cooks Illustrated, because people want access to a full database. So it's like it, that's the mix of the premium. Is like people pay subscription if the information is valuable enough to them. So it doesn't work across the board, but I think it works in some spaces. Niche, uh, niches. Yeah, niches. Yeah, no. sports is just a really big niche. Yeah. What, what the issue is, that's why they make so much. We'll yeah. this in magazines, in which general insurance magazines were blown out of the water and replaced by special niche magazines. So it probably is something we can but learn about that kind of, of Not by lack of readership. 
They were blown out of the water because advertisers moved to television. Right. And that impact is all along when you talked about uh, in the 1950s, the change of political things. I have to go and look up who did this quote, but I think it will straighten me out on it. The, the quote is uh, the, Metro the Metropolitan newspaper will be no more liberal, more conservative than the owner of the downtown department store. Because you had aggregation of sales in just a few stores, you advertised, a few dependable advertisers, and those advertisers chose one paper. The other, the other paper died. Uh, afternoon papers died. The morning papers. So, um, I think if there's any last comments, I think we should just we should wrap up. But um, yeah. Yeah, I have one. Uh, it seems that we are thinking of the media organization of the traditional media organization, but for example, in um, internationally, a lot of international news is uh, produced and distributed by nonprofits. So, if we were to think, not in the media organization in the traditional way, but thinking on other kinds of organizations, like mm -hmm. nonprofits, who have one department or one section in which they are producing, in the same way that they produce PR material, they produce news. Mm -hmm. It is not objective news. They, they, it is not well, information, it, but it's information. Yeah, a good example of that is the Sierra Club. I did a case study on the Sierra Club, and they have a magazine, Sierra Magazine, has a huge distribution, um, I mean, huge circulation. And when I was talking to Mother Jones about it, they were like, yeah, but they're like not journalism. Like, the, you know, that has a bias, and they have an agenda, and they're an advocacy organization or whatever. Uh, but they do investigative reporting. Uh, what? Mother Jones, yeah, that's right, true, true, true. Uh, but it's tied to membership. Like, so the whole argument I was having with them was exactly that. Like, wh why, did, why didn't Mother Jones become a membership organization? Like Sierra Club, they get like, I don't know, $100 million from mem their membership fees. Um, but either way, they're doing journalism. Uh, and I think it, it goes to your point about using NGOs and, and nonprofits around that as well. So any other last minute thoughts? There's a lot more information. I just felt like I was hitting overload. And, and you all were hitting overload, but there's a lot more in there uh, that might be useful for folks. I think this framework, regardless of the particular trends and cases, asking those questions and comparing that matrices allows for adaptation. Um, so I think that's useful to apply in different situations. So thanks, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, fun. Thank you.